Welcome in for this Wednesday edition of Fet. I'm your host, Anita Marks, and we've got a jam-packed show. We are bringing a lot your way in the next 30 minutes. Up Daddy is going to be joining us, talking some NHL with some games on the slate and looking ahead, of course, to the playoffs. Tom Lukenville is going to join us. He's part of the ESPN broadcast team for the XFL with some XFL plays for you coming up on the slate this weekend. Oscar Buster Olney is going to join us. It is Major League Baseball opening day tomorrow. Are you heading out to the ballparks? I certainly wish I was. And last but not least, we'll touch base with Baltimore. Jamison Hinsley uh, will give us an update on what's going on with Lamar Jackson and the Baltimore Ravens and that whole drama and ordeal as it is unfolding. But let's bring in the puck daddy, Greg Wyshynski. Greg, great to be with you on this Wednesday afternoon. How you doing, my friend? Doing fantastic, doing fantastic. The weeks are ticking away until it's cup crazy time, Anita, in the National Hockey League. Absolutely, and you can guarantee that I will be blowing up your cell phone to be a guest on all my radio <laughs> programs. But let's dive into the good word as we do each and every Wednesday. Uh, this is kind of fun. So Emmanuel Closet, 7-1 to one to lead Major League Baseball in saves this coming season. Puck Daddy, what's your good word? The good word here is haterade, as in what I am drinking when I say that it is going to be Josh Hader of the San Diego Padres to lead Major League Baseball in saves this season. You know, he struggled midway through last season, fixed his mechanics. We all saw what he's capable of in the playoffs. So I'll take Hader on a very good Padres team that I think will win the NL West. Uh, and also, Anita, it's a contract year, so pump up them stats. I'll take Josh Hader. So my good word is run, as in run it back, baby. That's right. He won it last season. <laughs> uh, first in games finished last season at 67. First in appearances at 77. Um, you know, Cleveland plays a lot of close games. Therefore, I think his number is going to be called a lot this season, just like we saw last season. And so, listen, when you've got a 100-mile-per-hour cutter and a nasty slider that he's got in his repertoire, watch out. I think the dude runs it back. Let's talk about some college hoops, baby. UConn beats Miami by 10 to 12 points. And you could get that at plus 650. Greg, what you doing here? What's your good work? A good word here is caned, as in my skepticism of the Miami Hurricanes has been literally beaten out of me in this tournament. I took Drake against him. That's a mistake. I bet him against him again. That's a mistake. Look it, they're an underdog that plays like a favorite, and the bottom line for me in this matchup is that the ghosts of Mason Nation, the George Mason Cinderella team that Jim Laranego was a part of, they're going to haunt UConn again. I, listen, I, there's no way they're losing by double digits. I think they get within the five and a half point spread, and it wouldn't shock me to pull to see them pull the upset over the Huskies. Yeah, I'll go one step further, right? Like, I doubted them against Drake. I doubted them against Indiana. I certainly did not have them beating Texas. But my good word here is steam, as in steamrolling teams, because that's what the Huskies have been doing, Greg. Unbelievable, right? I mean, 12th best defense against the three. I think that's really what's going to come into play here. Um, they have the athleticism not only to defend the rim, but also the length and athleticism to defend the perimeter. And that's where Miami makes all their shots. And UConn has been steamrolling teams. They've beaten teams 24 points, 15 points, 23 points, 28 points. So needless to say, I'm obviously going to lay the five and a half. We're going to get to those picks a little bit later on the show. But my good word is steam, as in steamrolling some folks. Last but not least, <laughs> let's talk about your wheelhouse. And that's the NHL. The Western Conference wins, a team out of the Western Conference wins the Stanley Cup at plus 152. What's your good word? The good word here is beasts, as in beasts of the East, baby. You're talking about five of the top six teams in the National Hockey League are all in the Eastern Conference. The sixth best team in the Eastern Conference, yeah, that's the Tampa Bay Lightning, who have won two of the last three Stanley Cups in the National Hockey League. The West is actually going to be a kind of a tough trip. I think those teams have really improved since the trade deadline, but I'm playing, I'm playing the field of the Eastern Conference to win the Cup. The only way the West wins, in my opinion, is if Connor McDavid and Leon Draisaitl decide it is time for Edmonton to win the Cup, in which case, Anita, my preseason pick of the Oilers will look genius. 
so my good word is inferior okay the west is not as good as the east and you know this better than i do you use the word beast right uh, in the east you're looking at the bruins toronto tampa bay the canes let's uh, give some love to the rangers and the devils over here in our our part of the country uh meanwhile i don't know mcdavid can he play superman for the oilers i don't know colorado vegas <laughs> We'll see. I just think I'm with you. I just think the East is just too good. So my good word is inferior here for the Western Conference in the <laughs> NHL. All right, Greg, uh, before we let you go, there are a few games on the slate. Our producer Weimer like to call them sexy. OK, maybe I'll agree <laughs> with that. Let's start first and foremost with the Islanders who hold a wild card spot in the East. Uh, facing the Caps. Now, Caesar has them as a pick -em, minus 110 each way. The over-under is, uh, is is sitting at five and a half. What is your play in this game tonight? Well, I'm relieved to hear the number remains at five and a half because it shouldn't be. I'm taking the over in this game between the Caps and the Islanders. Look, the Capitals have obliterated this number in eight straight games. The Islanders have that reputation because of their goaltending of being a team that kind of keeps it close to the best. But on the road, They've hit the over to the tune of 19-16 and two this season. So five and a half, in my opinion, is a gift. I'll take the over in this point in what should be a pretty fun game between two teams. One in the playoffs, Anita. One mathematically not eliminated, but pretty much eliminated. Okay, let's talk about the Panthers. They go into Toronto, having dropped four straight. No bueno. Uh, they'll tra they trail the Penguins uh, for the second wild card spot by three points. So the Maple Leafs are the home favorite here, uh, but the total goals is set at seven. So curious, a lot higher than five and a half there, Greg. Uh, what are, how are you playing this one? <laughs> yeah, there'll be goals of plenty in this one. I'm taking the Panthers on the money line here. This is do or die for them. They got a brief brief last night with the Penguins losing. Uh, so their faint playoff hopes remain alive. They need a strong road trip here. They got Toronto. They got Montreal, and they got Columbus, and then they play four of their last five in Florida where they play really, really well. So they know what they need to do here in Toronto. They need a victory in the worst way. And analytically, they've not been terrible lately. They just not have, they just haven't gotten the results. So I'll take them here for an upset bid over the Maple Leafs at home. Okay, finally, we've, we've saved the sexiest for last. Again, at least that's what our <laughs> producer tells me, okay? Uh, and that's the Wild going up against the Avs. Um, as we know, the team separated by just one point at the top of the standings. Uh, the Avs are home. They're a home favorite tonight. What's the best way to tackle this matchup? Well, as anyone who watches Daily Wager knows, I love me a team total. So I will take a team total under two and a half goals for the Minnesota Wild in this game. They've been over that total in eight of their last ten games, Anita, but... When they play good teams like Boston or New Jersey in that stretch, those are the times when the Wild couldn't get over the two and a half. So Colorado, very good team, very good defensive team. I like this to be a low scoring affair between two teams that are, are going to have good goaltending in this game. And I like it to be extra low scoring for the Wild. I think they just get under that two and a half, but that's my play in this game uh, in Denver tonight. Fantastic. Great stuff, Puck Daddy. Appreciate you. Good luck with all the games on the slate in the NHL tonight. I'm sure we'll see you a little bit later on Anytime. on Daily Wager. Uh, we go from the NHL to the XFL. Tom Luganville joining us now. You saw him on the big Monday night stage. It was great stuff. Uh, Tom, before we start diving into this week's slate of games, week seven, DC just looks so good. They are now, in, and they were heading into week six, number one in my power rankings agree or disagree like dc just has really got they're checking all the boxes now as we get closer to the postseason right yeah they really are and i would completely agree with that and let's not overcomplicate it the bottom line is they don't beat themselves they they had three penalties the other night houston had 12. all right they don't turn the ball over they're like plus five or six in turnover margin right now they play well in the kicking game and they're so difficult to defend uh, when they are on offense because they're like a college team. You have to defend all 11 players in the run game because they'll run zone read, quarterback draw, quarterback counter, quarterback power. So they're unique to the other teams in the rest of the league and they don't beat themselves. All right, so let's dive into week seven. Let's start with Friday. You got Seattle going up against Arlington. Arlington has struggled offensively. Like only once this season have they put up 20 points 
uh, which is nothing, obviously, to write home about. Seattle on the opposite side, they won four games, so they're coming in, right? Hot, they're looking good. Uh, they are a road favorite at minus four and a half. The over-under is 37 and a half. Bill, how, Tom, how are you playing it? This is my most difficult one to handicap of the weekend. And listen, I, I like Seattle here. I do uh, as, as the favorite. And But I'm going to go with the under. And you may say, well, that's kind of odd. Well, to your point, with Arlington, they've only been able to score over 20 points one time. And the issue with Seattle, although they've won four games in a row, they're minus 10. Minus 10 in turnover margin. So they are a statistical anomaly. If I felt confident that they could consistently protect the ball, I'd take the over here. But I think they'll find ways to give the ball to Arlington and lose out on points. Now, they've been able to compensate with points in the kicking game and points on defense, but I don't trust that just yet until they prove it. So I'm going to go with Seattle. I'm going to go with the under here. Yeah, I am with you on Seattle. Like I said, they've won four straight, and a lot of it, Tom, as we know, has been because of special teams, right? McKnight put up yeah. over 200 return yards. They're blocking punts left and right. Um, and their playoff hopes are still alive. So I think there's going to be a sense of urgency there on the Seattle side. As for Arlington, um, you know, losing to San Antonio, they did not look good. Uh, defense is solid. Offense is horrible. And I don't see anybody coming to the rescue right now. And I think that they've got some big question marks in regard to their offensive coordinator that Bob Stoops, I think, needs to address. Not sure if he's going to address at, uh, at during the season. Uh, let's look at San Antonio. What's going on? San Antonio in Vegas. The last time these two teams matched up, possibly, should we call it a snooze fest? 12 to 10. Not a lot of offensive production, pr production there. Uh, Vegas is favored here at three and a half. The over under is 37 and a half. One would look at that last game and say, oh, you got to play the under here. Which way are you rolling? Well, I don't agree with Vegas that Vegas should be the favorite. I would actually take San Antonio here. And it's not as if Vegas has home field advantages like D.C. and St. Louis do when they play at home. So not exactly a hostile environment. And here's the interesting thing. San Antonio has been plagued by more injuries than any other team in the league, particularly on offense. They're going on their fourth quarterback. So it's not as if they've necessarily been sloppy as if they've had been heavily penalized. I think they're only minus one in turnover margin on the season. But they signed Kirk Benkirk last week on a Thursday, and he comes in and plays and gets them the win last weekend. So I think with an extra week under his belt, they're going to be better on offense than they've been before. And then you've got Vegas, who trades away Luis Perez, all right, who at times had shown some bright moments for the Vegas offense. I just think San Antonio's the better team here. I'm going San Antonio, and I do agree with the under. Yeah, um, lockstep with you. I'm with San Antonio here as well. They beat the Renegades last week. Good defense. Yes, they struggle offensively, but Vegas, they're 1-5. and five. What did Bill Parcells always say, Tom? Your record, you are who your record indicates you are, and I believe that is Vegas. Yep. And let's be honest, I'm sure you've been to that field. It's far from home field advantage. So uh, I'm with you. I do like San Antonio. Uh, let's get straight to the Sunday night game. This is going to be a good one, arguably maybe the best one on the slate, and that's St. Louis going against Houston. Both teams sitting at 4-2, and two, playoff hopes alive, obviously, for both of them. Uh, Houston is a three-point favorite at home. The over-under is 43 and a half. So do we expect some points in this matchup? I think we are expecting some points, but maybe not early from Houston. If you paid attention to Houston the last two weeks, remember they came out of the gate like gangbusters and were just ripping through people offensively. They have really struggled since they lost John Trey Kirkland, their star receiver on the road against Seattle two weeks ago, and they haven't been able to, to create the explosive plays that they had been routinely getting in the first four weeks of the season. However, the reason why I like the over here is they find ways to score late. And I think right now, St. Louis is playing good enough football to go on the road and not only score points, but to win this game. So I'm going with St. Louis, and I'm also taking the over, not just because I think St. Louis can score, I do, but I think Houston could get back on track enough, particularly in the second half, to score to hit the over. This is gonna be very, very intriguing because Houston has not been themselves on offense. And if they can get back on track, 
and maybe it's this week at home, this thing could turn into a track meet, but I like St. Louis. Yeah, listen, uh, we're, we're locked up with all, all of our picks here. Tom, I'm with you. I like St. <laughs> Louis as well, right? They beat Las Vegas really in a dominant fashion, 29 to 6. Good defense. AJ yep. McCarron, if you recall, had you on my radio show quite a few times this season. I said AJ McCarron to win the MVP, 236 yards and three touchdowns last week. Uh, their offensive line is finally healthy. And for Houston, coming off of a loss to DC, they've lost two straight. They're dealing with some injuries and they've got some questions at the quarterback position. So I'm with you. I do like St. Louis as well. Tom, thank you so much for spending some time with us this afternoon. Really do appreciate it. Uh, keep, keep doing such a phenomenal job with the ESPN broadcast on the XFL. Thank you. I'll do my best. Thanks for having me. You got it. You got it. All right. So we go from the XFL to Major League Baseball. It is opening day tomorrow. One of my favorite days of the year. Buster Olney joins us here. How fortunate are we? Get, we get Buster on bet. And Buster, you're coming to us live from Houston. You're going to be at the Houston Astros game tomorrow. Uh, by the way, my pick, I know I'm not going out on a limb here. I'm pretty much going chalk, but I think Houston could run it back. I think they could win the World Series again. I know they lost Verlander, but I think it's next man up with Valdez and in that pitching rotation. Are you feeling this Astros team? How confident are you that they could run it back? Anita, I would agree with you, and I am picking the Astros to get back to the World Series. By the way, they would become the first team to win a World Series and get back to the World Series the next year since the 2001 Yankees. They, if they win the World Series this year, they'd be the first team since the 98 to 2000 Yankees to go back to back. I don't think they're going back to back. I got the Padres beating them in the World Series, but I agree with you. This is an organization with a ton of depth, and yes, they lose Justin Verlander, but it's a team that I think is going to go very far this year. Yeah, they just, they check all the boxes. All right, let's dive into it, Buster. Eight former Cy Young winners will be starting opening day pitchers tomorrow. But let's talk about the Mets and the Marlins. Why? Because they're the only matchup where you've got two Cy Young winners facing each other, of course, in Max and Sandy. So uh, the Mets are the road favorite there. So uh, should I jump on the Marlins as a home dog? How would you play this? Absolutely, I would, because Sandy is so good pitching at home. If you look at his home road splits last year in Miami's home ballpark, 8-1 and one with a 1.64 ERA. And, and let's face it, right now, Akintara is kind of a one-of-a-kind in baseball. He's a throwback to what aces used to be, throwing 230, 240, 250 innings. You know what Max Scherzer, Justin Verlander were earlier in their careers. He wants to be a guy with the baseball in the eighth and ninth inning. I'm sure on opening day he's going to be juiced up. The Marlins did improve their offense during the course of the offseason. Defense might be an issue, but I think on opening day, I agree with you, that's a good bet. Let's continue to, to talk starting pitching because there is a Major League Baseball special wager that you can take that there will be a 20-game winner this season. Okay, it's juiced at minus 115 each way. Number one, do you think that we'll have a 20-game winner this season? And if so, who, Buster? No, I don't think there's going to be. I think that Kyle Wright, who, of course, did that last year, that was an outlier with incredibly good fortune. I mean, he only threw 180 innings, and there were so many games the Braves were playing where they would come back in his last inning of work or maybe take the lead after he was removed from a game. And it was a remarkable season, but I think he would be the first to admit he got a little lucky getting that many wins. And look, as we talked about with Alcantara, the starting pitchers just simply are not used in the way that they were in the past. They don't have as many opportunities for win. Anita, think about this number. Last year, a total of eight pitchers threw 200 or more innings. In 2010, that number was 45. So I just don't think starting pitchers are in the game long enough to get wins. Kyle Wright, I think, uh, in 2022, we should look at is being in a situation that's not going to be repeated. Okay, um, now let's uh, let's talk about rotations here. Let's talk about some of the, the hits leaders, right? And let's, here are the top six in odds this season. More righties, actually, Buster, than I thought there would be. But with the shift being, um, you know, of course, eliminated this season in Major League Baseball, just out of curiosity, how do you think that would affect 
this list, and, and who would you play here in regard to the hits lead? Okay, I'm shocked that Rafael Devers is not right at the top of that list because a lot of projection systems uh, will tell you that they, there's a belief that with uh, the regulations against defensive shifts that Devers as a left-handed hitter is going to take advantage of that, but he would not be the guy that I would bet on. I think the guy to watch this year to lead the Major League in hits is Bo Bichette of the Toronto Blue Jays because he seemed to turn a corner at the end of last year. He went crazy down the stretch. Last 37 games, he batted 387 uh, with 58 hits. And you could see that still playing out this spring, his aggressiveness at the plate. Do you know, for this particular statistic, you don't want to pick a guy who's too patient at the plate. And Bo Bichette is someone who attacks the baseball. I think he's going to have a great year, maybe be the one guy who you know, could throw out 225, 230 hits. Bo Bichette, eight to one, by the way, if you missed that on the graphic. All right, finally, let's talk about stealing bases, right? I saw the new uh, bases, you know, the the, extent, the 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 bigger base. They look like a, a pizza box, Buster. I, I'm sure you've seen them as well. So with the expanded bases and, of course, the, the limiting the throws to first, do you think that we'll get a 75 stolen base, um, you know, player this season? Um, you know, we, as we know, it's only happened once in 1996. Does it happen this season? No, I don't think it does. And look, there's an expectation in Major League Baseball that you're going to see like a 30% increase in stolen base attempts. I think uh, on opening day, we're going to get the first feel for how teams are going to take advantage of these new rules for pitchers, how many pickoffs, the step-offs that they will wind up taking. But here's the thing, as we see in the NBA with load management, what you hear a lot among Major League players is they want to save the wear and tear on their body from the stolen bases, sliding in head first. I think the best person in baseball in terms of stealing bases is Trey Turner. He would have, more than, have to more than double his total from 2022 to get there. And I just don't think there's a mindset now among players to, you know, to attempt 75, 80, 100 steals. That's just not the way baseball is played now in 2023 when players are concerned about saving their bodies to make sure they can be on the field the next day. I just wonder, Buster, with the change of all the rules, I just wonder if there'll be a player or two, maybe three out there, that are going to try to achieve that this season. It will be fun to watch. Buster, thank you so much. You're one of the most wanted men on all our platforms, and so we're, uh, we're thrilled to have you here on BET this afternoon. Thank you. Enjoy opening day. Thanks, Nita. You got it. From Buster Olney, uh, we're, we're going to check in with Jamison Hinsley in just a second. Now, Jamison Hinsley does a phenomenal job covering the Baltimore Ravens. In fact, I lived in Baltimore for four years. I've known Jamison for quite a while. This whole situation with Lamar Jackson has just really gone off the rails, let's be honest. But who has really the leverage here? And Jamison Hinsley feels that the Baltimore Ravens do. Let's listen in. Anita, here with the Ravens, it looks like Lamar Jackson has a decision to make. Does he play under the franchise tag with the Ravens, or does he sit out the entire 2023 season? Jackson announced this week that he requested a trade from the Ravens, and Baltimore placed the non-exclusive franchise tag on Jackson back on March 7th. That means for over three weeks, Jackson has been able to talk to other teams, but there's been no indication that he's been close to signing an offer sheet with any of them. Now, the next key date to remember is July 17th. That is the deadline for Jackson to sign a multi-year offer sheet with another team. If he fails to do so, Jackson has two choices. He can play under the franchise tag for $32 million, or he can become the first player since Le'Veon Bell in 2018 to sit out an entire season. I asked Ravens coach John Harbaugh this week if he expects Lamar Jackson to play under the franchise tag. Harbaugh's response, I don't know. Wow. 
Uh, it's just really going to be interesting to see how this all unfolds. Um, again, in order for a team to trade or, or to go after Lamar Jackson, uh, they would offer, have to offer him, you know, he's looking for the deal that Deshaun Watson got from the Cleveland Browns, which is about $55 million a year on, on their cap hit each year for the Cleveland Browns and, um, and given up two first-round draft picks for the Ravens. So uh, let's take a look at this in regard to life without Lamar for the Baltimore Futures. Uh, to win a title, 30 to 1, win the conference 18 to 1, win the division plus 270, win total 8 and a half. To be quite honest, I I'm all about the Cincinnati Bengals this season. I love Cincinnati. Give me Cincinnati coming out of, the, out of this division, winning the AFC North, and also I like them winning the Super Bowl this year. I'm really, really high on Cincinnati, whether or not the Baltimore Ravens have Lamar Jackson or not. As always, we like to end the show with Before I Let You Go, and uh, I've got a lot to give you before I let you go. First and foremost, uh, let's start with some college hoops. As we know, the Final Four on Saturday, it all starts around 6 o'clock. Give me San Diego State. I'll lay the points. Also, I like the under here. As we know, they've won 14 of their last 15. And if you're a really big believer that defense wins championships, San Diego State is the way you want to roll. Uh, they held, marinating this for a minute, and Alabama and Creighton combined to only three three-pointers. Creighton, two of 17 from behind the arc. And this is how FAU rolls. Uh, they rely a lot on that three-point shooting. Also, keep in mind, they're going to be playing in a stadium, NRG Stadium. So depth perception might play a role. So give me San Diego State. Give me the under. Also, I love UConn. They've just been steamrolling people, as we talked about earlier. Hawkins, over 16 and a half points as well. Um, they are the only team remaining in the Final Four that are top 11 in offense and defensive efficiency. They've got the 12th best defense against three-point shooting. Again, same philosophy with the University of Miami as I'm taking with FAU. Miami, they've just been winning because of their shooting and their, their backcourt and their guard play. UConn is athletic. They're long. They're going to defend it well. And so I think U University of Miami is going to have a hard time scoring here. So uh, those are my plays heading into the final four. I also have some plays for you in the Valero that's starting tomorrow. That's right. This is the Masters warm-up. Now, keep in mind, there's only 10 golfers that have qualified for the Masters. That means everybody else who's going to be teeing off this weekend, this is their golden ticket if they win the Valero, they get invited to the Masters. So there's going to be a lot of aggressive play. They're playing at TPC in San Antonio. What are some of the metrics I was looking at heading into this matchup to pick the guys who I think are going to do well? Well, definitely driving accuracy. Why? This is a Parkland style course. So it's a lot of trees, tree lines. So you need to be accurate. You want your drives in the middle of the fairway and putting. Seven of the last eight winners finished top five in putting average. So putting average is really, really important in assessing who's going to do well here. So number one, let's go with JJ Spawn. I like him to finish in the top 10. He finished ninth at the Dell Technologies. Solid in putting, solid in driving accuracy. Uh, he's going to defend. He's trying to defend his title from last year. So this is a great, great course fit for him. Also top four in scrambling. Give me Nick Taylor to finish in the top 10 as well. Did not go deep in match play. Therefore, he's going to have fresh legs coming in. Second at Phoenix, 10th at Valspar. And a tournament that you want to look at in regard to analogy. Guys who do well at the Genesis do well here um, at the Valero. And he finished in the top 30. Also, his flag, his flag stick has been terrific. He's putting fantastic. Actually, in the season, 11th in putting accuracy. And last but not least, Give me the man who's defying grandfather time, and that's Matt Kuchar. I got, I got him to finish in the top 20. Uh, he finished ninth at the Dell as well, eighth at the Genesis, 10 for 10 on this track in making the cut, four top 10s, four top 15s, and first in scrambling this season. So give me Kuchar as well. So uh, we've got you locked and loaded, do we not, right? Golf. Uh, NCAA action, NHL, XFL, Major League Baseball. So, uh, so buckle up. It's going to be a fun next few days. Thank you so much for tuning in to bed. Have a great night, everybody.